so the, the last really thing we're going to talk about is, uh, or one of the last things we'll talk about is how does all of this respiration, how do all these processes kind of get controlled? How does your body know what to do? Um, at what rate at which should you breathe? Um, and it's, it's really um, three little clusters of nuclei within your brainstem. So it's your brainstem really that controls your respiratory rates. You have two sets of nuclei in the medulla oblongata and one set of nuclei in the pons. The ventral respiratory group is actually your rhythm generator. It's what sets your, what we call the eupnea. It's your kind of normal respiratory rhythm. For most of us, that's 12 to 15 breaths per minute. Um, and here's our little ventral respiratory group. The dorsal respiratory group basically modifies that rhythm. It gets um, some information from different sensors um, and, and kind of helps just kind of coordinate um, and, and modify our um, kind of normal respiratory rhythm. Then the pontine respiratory group is really what then gives us that fine control. Um, you know, right, when you, when you talk, when you sing, when you exercise, um, you change your respiratory rate and you need control over that. Um, and that is really coming out of the pontine group in the brainstem. Um, in terms of the nerves, um, we've got intercostal nerves that come out of the ventral respiratory group. Uh, or that connect to the ventral respiratory group that innervate all of your intercostal muscles. And then it's actually the phrenic nerve that innervates your diaphragm. And again, it connects to that ventral respiratory group. Um, in terms of how we think we get this kind of respiratory rhythm, um, our best guess, our best hypothesis is that you basically have pacemaker neurons. So kind of like you had pacemaker cells in your heart. Well, we think we have pacemaker um, cells in that ventral respiratory group. And, and so you have kind of this interconnected set of pacemaker cells that kind of the, the modification, the, the breathe now, don't breathe now, breathe now, don't breathe now, breathe now, don't breathe now, is what really kind of sets that 12 to 15 breaths per minute respiratory rhythm that is normal for most of us. Um, in terms of what can affect the rate and the depth at which we breathe, um, the depth is determined primarily um, about how much are your respiratory muscles stimulated. If your respiratory muscles are more stimulated, they're going to contract more and you're going to get a deeper breath. Um, the rate is determined by how long the respiratory center activates the muscles. Um, so if the respiratory center is sending stimuli for 30 seconds as opposed to 10 seconds, um, you're going to have a faster respiratory rate. And both of these things, of course, we're going to use our body's demands. What are we doing? What is our body doing at this particular time? Um, and that's really what determines the rate and depth at which we breathe. Um, the, a couple other things that um, affect this, um, we're going to look at um, the partial pressure of oxygen, carbon dioxide, and pH. These chemical factors are actually the most important um, kind of determining factor in the rate and depth at which we breathe. We're also going to talk about how higher brain centers, like your cortex, um, influence your breathing. And then we're going to talk about two reflexes, the pulmonary irritant reflex and the inflation reflex. Let's look at the chemical factors first, since they are the ones that are really the, the kind of driving force. Um, and believe it or not, it's actually not the need for oxygen that is really the, the driving factor behind how much, how fast and how much you breathe in. It's actually the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Um, if you get a lot of carbon dioxide building up, if you get an increase in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide building up, CO2, unfortunately, accumulates in your brain. Well, as we saw um, with our previous lecture, CO2 
joins with water to become carbonic acid. Well, carbonic acid pretty easily disassociates into hydrogen ions, which decreases our pH and increases our acidity. That increase in acidity is um, recognized by a bunch of chemoreceptors in your central nervous system that connect directly to the respiratory centers. And so the respiratory then, centers then say, oh, holy cow, we have all this CO2 that we're building up that we need to get rid of. And so they will increase the depth and rate at which we breathe, which then means we're exhaling more CO2, which lowers our partial pressure of carbon dioxide and brings the pH back to normal. Here we go, negative feedback again. Um, so here we go. Uh, if we have an increase in our partial pressure of carbon dioxide, the pH gets uh, decreased um, uh, around the brain um, because of the way carbon dioxide combines um, to carbonic acid, which disassociates to hydrogen ions. That then is sensed by some chemoreceptors, uh, which send information to the respiratory centers in the medulla. And the respiratory centers in the medulla say, hey, holy cow, we've got lots of carbon dioxide. Um, we got to get rid of it. And activates your respiratory muscles. You increase your ventilation. You increase the rate and depth at which you breathe. More CO2 gets exhaled. And our partial pressure of carbon dioxide and our pH go back to normal. Um, so no, when you are holding your breath, it is not actually the need for oxygen that says, ha, ah, must breathe. It is actually the buildup of carbon dioxide and your body's need to get rid of the carbon dioxide. Um, the reason why it's not really the need for oxygen is that, remember, we have this huge, huge reservoir of oxygen that's bound onto all of our hemoglobin molecules. And in fact, it requires a substantial, a huge drop in the partial pressure of oxygen in our arteries to actually have any sort of effect on ventilation. Um, if you were to get your oxygen levels to drop so precipitously, that would be sensed by chemoreceptors and cause your respiratory centers to become more active. Um, but because we have so much oxygen bound to hemoglobin, it is really not the need for oxygen that drives an increase in respiratory depth and rate, but the need to get rid of CO2. Um, in terms of higher brain centers, um, in term, we, we really can, we can talk about the hypothalamus and we can talk about the cerebral cortex. So the hypothalamus works through the limbic system um, to resp regulate respiratory rates. Um, think about um, when you're in pain, you're kind of gasping. Um, many of us, when we're angry, tend to hold our breath. Um, that, that's, that's an emotion causing a change in respiratory rate. That, it's working through the limbic system and the hypothalamus. Um, since the hypothalamus also controls your body temperature, um, it can then change your respiratory rate because as your body temperature increases, your respiratory rate also increases. Um, and then we have cortical control, cerebral cortex, um, that we can exert conscious control over our respiration, right? When you voluntarily hold your breath, um, like you guys did in the lab, um, then that is your conscious control, your cerebral cortex, completely overriding the medullary centers in the brain stem. Now, of course, we can only hold our breath for so long. And again, when the CO2 levels become um, kind of uh, to a precipitous point, to a, oh my gosh, we have to get rid of this carbon dioxide, that is when you feel like you just you have to breathe. Again, it's not that you need oxygen, it's that you have to get rid of the CO2. Lastly, we're going to look at two reflexes. The first of these is the irritant reflex. Essentially, you have receptors in your bronchioles that kind of respond to dust and mucus, smelly things, um, and then that basically says um, via the 
vagal nerve, so cranial nerve number 10, um, to the respiratory centers that, hey, this is not good for us. Um, and you get kind of this reflexive constriction of your air passages. You don't have to consciously do it. Your body does it all itself. It's, an, it's a reflex. Um, but that constriction of your air passages uh, essentially prevents the dust, the noxious fumes, whatever it may be, from getting down further into the alveoli, further into the body, and reaching those kind of more um, fragile alveoli. Um, this irritant reflex is also what um, triggers sneezes um, and, and coughing. Um, it's that kind of, oh, this is this is frustrating and, and kind of nagging at me and I must cough, sneeze, and get rid of it. Or in the case of your bronchioles, if we're further down into the respiratory passageways, constriction of those passageways. Um, the last reflex is the inflation reflex. You basically have stretch receptors in your air passages and in the pleura themselves that basically sense when the lungs are inflated. And then they say, oh, hey, the lung has inflated. It's filling with oxygen. We should probably then return it to normal. And it basically sends some of those inhibitory signals um, up to the VRG. And that says, hey, we've got enough. Time to end this inhalation and exhale. And then, then you exhale and the lungs kind of deflate. And so if we look at kind of all of this all together, um, again, there are some higher brain centers like the cerebral cortex and the hypothalamus that can exert control on the brain stem, our respiratory centers, we have a ventral group, a dorsal group, and one group in the pons. Um, again, hypothalamus here, um, acting through pain, um, that can change our respiratory rate, our irritant receptors that cause um, constriction of our bronchioles, that can change our respiratory rate. The stretch receptors, that inflation reflex, when the body has sensed that the lungs are inflated, it says, hey, it's time to end inhalation and start exhalation. That changes the way we uh, respire. But again, primarily we're talking about the chemicals, the pH, the carbon dioxide in particular, um, that are really going to determine um, our respiratory rate and our respiratory rhythm. Um, the very last thing we're going to talk about is um, what happens when we go to a high altitude. Um, uh, if we go very quickly um, above 8,000 feet, you end up with what they call acute mountain sickness. You get the headaches, the shortness of breath, you're dizzy and nauseous because um, the, the pressure and the partial pressure um, is so much lower at higher altitudes that you're not getting enough oxygen and that's why you feel dizzy and nauseous and it's hard to breathe. Um, and if this were to continue, you actually could end up with edema in your lungs or in your brain um, because your body's just not getting enough oxygen. Um, but luckily for us, we acclimatize. Um, so your respiratory system and your blood make adjustments for long-term changes in altitude. I had friends in college, we lived on an island in the Gulf of Mexico, and then they moved to Colorado, to Denver. That's a huge difference in elevation and altitude. Um, and so their respiratory systems had to acclimatize. Um, and it happens quite rapidly, actually. Um, when the partial pressure of oxygen becomes less, kind of atmospherically, your chemoreceptors that respond to the partial pressure of carbon dioxide becomes even more responsive. Um, and you can already get an increase in your ventilation um, even just a couple days higher, even just a couple days later to um, where you're increasing the amount of air that you breathe in and out, the volume of air that you breathe in and out, two to three liters higher than you would at sea level. And so your 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 body's like, well, okay, we're, we've got, you know, this, this very dramatic decrease in partial pressure of oxygen, so we've got to 
increase our amount of air that we're breathing in and out. Um, and as I said, it can happen quite quickly. The other thing that usually happens is your kidneys will produce more EPO, which means we get more erythropoiesis happening in our red bone marrow. So we get more red blood cells. So our red blood cells can carry more oxygen. Um, and so both your respiratory system and your blood respond when you move to a higher altitude versus a lower altitude. And there's my battery dying on my computer. Luckily, that's the end of the respiratory system chapter.